time that started, he wasn't around at all, and Rob Atkinson, who was really wonderful to work with, was the main producer. At Prism. At Prism, mm -hmm. yeah. And I started doing kind of a range of things from reviews and uh, weird stand-up bits to it finally becoming simply op-ed, which I love doing. Um, but I I think I've, I've talked about uh, the the bunker and the start of the newspaper that wasn't to be because uh, Malcolm died very suddenly um, in that period. And w since I was still on PRISM, at the time I thought he'd had a lot to do with the start of the uh, show before that, Gable Vision, and there was this continuity along the shows. And I, I thought we should definitely do some tribute. And... So I uh, asked his partner, who kind of just just um, blew me off of he didn't know exactly when Malcolm had gone to Oxford and got his D Phil from Oxford, um, uh, but he thought he'd gone to UBC. So I called UBC registrar, and I found out that actually he hadn't completed a degree. Um, and the other thing, at his very large memorial service, there were a lot of people there. Um, he, uh, his mother actually had done a lot of work in getting Gary Patterson finally brought in as their first openly gay minister at that, or priest at, I think it was an Anglican church. But in any case, the person who did his eulogy from the church had said how Malcolm entertained the children and would come in at, at uh, in costume as a clown at some parties. So I thought, okay, well, I can't do anything with the the degree bit, but I'll f this is a little-known side of Malcolm, so I called that person up, the Anglican priest whom Gary later, I think, took over for, and I said, well, tell me, a bit, tell me about these parties. And... The first thing he said was, oh, Malcolm terrified the children. So I just said, well, thank you very much. And that was the end of the tribute. But I'm not saying that really all just to, to trash Malcolm, because I think probably in his way, whether it was with people or against people, he probably was part of the formation of a number of organizations that went on, but he was in a position to uh, have access to his mother's money and took it because there was quite, I think, an upheaval after that. And uh, I think his mother had had no idea that uh, uh, she was going to be f funding a gay newspaper if indeed that's where the money was going to wind up, or did, or, or who knows what happened to it. I don't well, know. Uh, apparently uh, he was using money from his family without their knowing about it to seed efforts with the Pride Parade as well. Ah. Uh, and, uh, yeah. and that was discovered afterwards as well, and that's also why they suddenly had no money in 1993 for startup. And uh, so, uh. so both uh, Gary Penny and, and uh, Terry uh, Wallace uh, undertook fundraising and I think Gary Penny actually made some financial loans himself to seed the effort in 93 so that we wouldn't miss it one one year of the parade and after that of course they created the Vancouver Pride Society which was a, a democratic constitutional society unlike the one that Malcolm had designed see originally what happened here the first Pride Parade was uh, put on by a combination of the Community Center and the Bus Greater Vancouver Business Association and a lot of other organizations and bars as well. And, but there was an or organization created uh, by the third one, and Malcolm took over that organization. And um, later on, he was challenged by Jim Diva for the, for the uh, leadership of this organization, and he uh, called a, an emergency meeting and terminated the society uh, and created a new society that institutionalized his leadership. In other words, a non-democratic 
So he created his own dictatorship so he could control this organization. And that was the organization that was still in place when he died. And mm -hmm. so after they rescued the parade that year, they de determined to create uh, you know, a d democratic uh, constitutional um, organization. You went on for, uh, you said, like 10 more years on prison? Or yeah, I went on till it ended. Um, and it was during that time, actually, I think before that time, uh, I wrote a column. I started it with Extra West, and I went on two and a half years with that. Um, I was actually the first woman columnist. I think I started in about the third issue. Um, Stan Persky and um, I can't think of his name is the first editor. Um, Gareth? Uh, uh, Gothrop, Dan Gothrop oh. was the first editor. Uh, he left fairly early on. I think he moved to Southeast Asia or something. I, and and Cindy Filipenko took over, but it was Daniel Gothrop who hired me originally as the uh, woman columnist uh, on the front page to offset uh, Stan Persky. And then I think Stan left and it was somebody else. Um, and I did that for two and a half years, and... What was the column called? Oh, I, I don't remember. I think my second one for Angles, I went to Angles after that, was called Older But Wilder. Uh, Untamed Tongue was what it was called in, in Extra West. So you wrote for Extra West first, and then for Angles. Yeah, huh. yeah two and a half years, and then... Um, I kind of was upset along with the other writers that we weren't paid more and I uh, again the columns were cut um, from 750 to 600 words and put inside the paper and didn't really like that I as an editor I I um, felt Cindy who was very much younger, 30 years younger than I, or something like that, didn't get some of my references, and she would just cut things. If she didn't understand it, she would cut it without any kind of reference back to me, so I would have these things that didn't make sense in, in the context. I work very hard at my writing. I'm extremely fussy about every syllable. Um, I fact check as you know as far as humanly possible, and I'm every comma matters, and and I just I found that very hard to deal with. So, uh, what did you think of uh, uh, Angle's uh, editor, Richard Banner? Oh well, uh, Richard Banner is the best editor I've ever had in my life. Um, his knowledge of grammar is so delicate and perfect and and you know I have an MA in English I think I know how to write but he ta taught me the difference between which and that and if he changed anything he was so respectful um, and usually it was a, an improvement and you know and he certainly consulted with me literally about every comma. That was my experience as a writer for Angles as well. And right now I'm working uh, with a group of queer seniors in an extraordinary writing group, Quirky, uh, that comes out of the center, the Generations Project, that I think has done a lot to promote the visibility of gays and lesbians and transgendered seniors, elders, and um, uh, we put on shows, we've done, we've done uh, art, we're always connected to computers, we're in our fourth year of funding from a variety of uh, very Byzantine sources. As long as our uh, instructor Claire Robson and right now Nancy Snyder is doing the technical part of it, as long as they've got good money, well, I don't care who it comes from. And I think we'll uh, uh, continue doing more things. I hope more theater for myself. Well, thank you very much for your interview. It's been most enlightening, and uh, thank you for your lifelong uh, work. Well, you too, David. I think I met you in year dot, something like that, right close to it. Yeah. <laughs> okay.